Today is Thursday, March 22nd of the Ryan HIV Planning Council. I'm really pleased to see we have a full house here. Um, as is our custom, we start with introductions and go around the room. I'm Matthew Blasier from Village Care, and I'm your um, elected community co-chair. I'll turn now to David. Hello, David Fox, Planning Council staff. Hi, David. Okay. Steve Hammond, Steve Hammond, Finance Officer. Paul Carr, Consumer Manhattan. Dave Abbott, Chair of Rules and Membership. Maria Diaz, Dry County Co-Chair and Consumer Committee Member. Hi, Jeff Mack, and how you school events in Oscar Lopez, that's what we'll do. Julie Lahane, Westchester County Department of Health. Grant Herman, New York City Department of Health. Matthew Abdul Hawk, Planning Council. This is Mark Lamato with the East County HIV Department. Lisa Best, Tri County Consumer Committee Planning Council. Agent Bettencourt, vocal leader, um, NAMI worker, and member of the committee. Good afternoon, Christopher Joseph from Mount Sinai, uh, Integration of Care, Community Health Care. Bill Gross from Sage. Thank you. Um, 
about to introduce our, our Bristol colleagues. They are here for a week site visit, and they are observing our meeting today. Um, can we stand, please, Steve and Sarah and Sylvia? Welcome. They've joined us today uh, for our council meeting. And um, feel free to ask some questions in the course of the meeting. They're a great resource. And they're also our funders. So, <laughs> fine. Um, thank you. David and Darrell, you want to go through the minutes and the materials? Sure. Minutes went out in advance, hopefully everyone had a chance to review them. Uh, they didn't get any corrections. Any corrections now? Not? Minutes are set. Darrell, do you want to go through the meeting materials? So there is no public comment in our packets today. Uh, we've got a the PowerPoint presentation that you see up on the screen. Uh, these are updates of our committee work, followed by the grantee report. After that, we'll have a presentation from Dr. Blackstock regarding the U equals U initiative. Uh, we've got draft minutes, which have been approved or are going to be approved. And then a packet of gear provider letters that uh, have been generated in response to the U equals U initiative and followed by our monthly planning council calendar. Thank you. So, Carol, there's no public comment here? There is not. There is not. Okay. Um, we're going to be moving on to committee updates. So, why don't we start with the consumers committee? Tuesday of this week, and uh, in, our, in our meeting, we discussed the consumer solar system um, quality improvement project, at which Dr. Hart, Dr. Christina Rodriguez Hart, led a discussion on the um, consumer solar system. We, did a, our, we had an outreach report from Jose Benedeva, who gave a, a report on his activity within the month of March. I mean, actually, for the past three months, he gave a report on that. Um, the consumers had a, <coughs> also gave a, gave a report by Paul Carr, on my right, on inspectors of food and nutrition. And <coughs> I gave a report on the cow, the, the cow, and how we want to try to see if we can get the cow um, funded. So that was basically. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Um, I would just like to take a moment to introduce Jose. Jose, can you step up to the microphone for a minute? Jose Colorado, and the council staff. So, Jose, on this uh, uh, this slide, um, we discuss uh, your work and uh, your visits to various uh, community-based organizations and your presentations. Can you share with us uh, what those experiences are? Sure. Um, I travel uh, all five boroughs, uh, try to uh, conduct outreach for the planning council to engage consumers to consider the possibility of becoming a consumer committee member or a planning council member, whichever they choose. Uh, in my daily practices, I find that uh, most of our folks are very afraid of speaking out. I've mentioned this before, this may come as an echo to many of you, but I need to continue to mention it because we know that many of our folks are in need and they're not seeking services. Not only are they afraid of speaking out in terms of advocacy, they are afraid of seeking out services. Many folks uh, are afraid of seeking out medical care. They're afraid of traveling to the emergency rooms, for example, for fear of deportation. Um, I, this has touched me very close. I have a very good friend and family, actually, in Texas, whose uh, mother and father were both chased by ICE and they were killed after that chase because of the fear of deportation. So the fear is very, very real. The church that I attend in the North Bronx, I speak to other folks that attend that church, and we notice a drastic reduction in the number of people that come into worship. So even to attend church is uh, troubling for some folks. So I just remind folks, those of us who can speak out, it's incumbent upon us to speak out for them because there's just a Definitely a fear of speaking out in our communities. Thank you, Jose. Uh, I would encourage council members to um, reach out to Jose 
Uh, if you have a cap at the facility and you'd like him to come to speak about the work of the Planning Council, he's available to you. Thank you, Jose. So the next committee would like to see an update from um, Integration of Care. Very right, good afternoon, everyone. My counterpart, Dre, is on the phone. So, hey, Dre. <laughs> Feel free to chime in. Um, so, starting in February, last met at the end of February, we start, we kind of switch gears a little bit. We will be uh, redrafting or re, um, uh, revisioning the service directive for food and nutrition services. So we had an overview in the last meeting of what that service category was, uh, how it's defined by HRSAs and top level data for the last few years. Uh, we will be meeting next Wednesday, a new location, it's a three hour meeting. We'll be hearing from service providers uh, who are currently delivering food and nutrition services. I believe they've also been surveyed in advance. And we'll have a panel discussion to kind of learn a little bit about what this program looks and feels like on the ground. There will also be a tour of um, GMHC's food nutrition program and has like we deliver food nutrition program for those of you who are interested in attending that. Uh, we will be meeting twice in April, April 4th, and then our usual uh, third uh, Wednesday of the month. Um, in true IOC fashion, we have a lot to cover. At the April 4th meeting, we will be hearing from other foods, uh, food and nutrition service providers, non running way funded, uh, to kind of understand some other best practices that are happening throughout the city. Um, Dre, did I miss anything? No, oh, that's everything, and we're really excited to learn more about how services are currently being provided, and we're looking forward to learning about new ways we might be able to uh, modify or improve the service catalog. So that being said, if you are a food and nutrition uh, Ryan White provider or are a food and nutrition non-Ryan White provider, you are welcome to attend. We also want to hear from <coughs> consumers who are a part of these programs. Um, that would be welcomed at the next two meetings as well, and we are serious about uh, these programs. So I have a question. Do you find that actually meeting with funded providers and non-funded providers who are actually doing the work is really going to shape a new directive in some meaningful ways? It's been our practice in the past, and I think one of the, I mean, my favorite questions that we asked the panel in the past is if you had, you know, all the money in the world and you wanted to add something to your program, what would it be? Because those are usually those things that people want to do but can't within their funding structure. So I think we really are open-minded when we ask that question. And alternatively, we say, what are some program elements that are required currently that may not actually benefit service delivery? So we can kind of alleviate some of those requirements. So yes, I really do think the panel discussions really benefit um, the drafting of our directives. Go ahead, John. Yeah, and if I can back, back that a little bit. Uh, as a consumer, I would like to see the staff at these meetings because when I hear what they're saying, and if I was part of the program, the nutrition program, I would be able to hear what they're saying and be able to say that it's not working the way you think it's working. Where if they're not there, then I, I can't be able to be it. So you're talking about <clears throat> staff of um, agencies that provide the services. Correct, but the IOC, we're gonna have, uh, I'm part of the IOC, I'm sorry. I'm part of the IOC, and that, that Wednesday, we're gonna have staff members come in. The following Wednesday, we may report this for consumers. Just a minor correction. Both meetings are for consumers to attend. We always want to see consumers in the room. Yeah. So March 28th, April 4th, and any time, any time a consumer wants to attend the IOC, they are welcome to come. We want to hear your voice. But especially March 28th and April 4th. So, yes, consumers are always welcome, but it's uh, basically geared for us to be able to have, this is what the staff have to say, what, what these food nutrition services contractors have to say. And as a consumer, I want to be able to hear what they're saying, so I can say, wait a minute, it, what you're saying it sounds good, but it's not working that way. Because as part of that program, I don't see where it's working. I think some of our more successful uh, invitations to providers um, have uh, come from frontline workers. Not the executive director of the organization, 
but the staff who actually interacts with the clients on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I'm hoping in our expansion of the invitation to providers that frontline workers come to the meetings and share with us what their day-to-day -day experience is of interacting with their clients. You had a question, Paul? Um, yeah. <clears throat> these are do we, I, these are two programs um, I know are, that we're visiting that are Ryan White budget programs. Are there any other ones that um, are why these two programs like that are happening out in the other like uh, the Bronx or Brooklyn? Um, and do we have any other plans? And who are they? Because we don't have a list of who they are. We don't know who these funded programs are. Um, and are we able to? Um, because I, I mean, I, I personally, I know GMHC has a really excellent program. I don't know about the other programs. Are we, you know, I just see some programs that actually may be struggling versus some of the uh, stuff that we've heard, some of the bad stuff we've heard out of programs. Are we going to have an opportunity to meet with them as well? I can take an attempt to answer that question. So the first part of your question, is to know all the funded programs that are publicly available on the Public Health Solutions website, so you can access the full list of writing that's part of the nutrition programs there. Um, we, have, we extended an invite to all providers to, to come next week. They were also surveyed, so even if they can't attend the meeting, they will hopefully be able to provide some input into their challenges and successes, so they'll be represented you know, through a, a survey. Um, I didn't help set up the tools of these two particular agencies, so I would prefer to know um, But yeah, if you want to know about all the funding programs, those are probably available now on Public Health Solutions website. <coughs> Quick, why would I have to go to a public health solutions website when I'm sitting in a committee meeting making decisions? Why can't I have that list in front of me? Graham, I will. This is your favorite question. <laughs> please, please follow Robert's rules of order. Alisa? Um, yeah. Since, since this is coming up, we've had this conversation a few times in the past. Yesterday, Ursa came to our consumer meeting and Listen, and one of the things that I mentioned was being the advocator in the washing machine. You got to clean the clothes. And I also mentioned that there are a lot of providers that are doing very, very good work. But there are some providers that are getting a substantial amount of money that are absolutely not providing the service that they are saying. So we have mentioned in the past, it has been said in the past that this is public information. And why aren't we able to have this discussion in printed materials of who's who? Um, Mark mentioned yesterday something about an extra $2 million being thrown into a particular directive or whatever without knowing what the problem is. To me, if you ask me, the consumer and not the director or the provider is giving extra money to programs that are not actually up and running, doing what they're supposed to do, not meeting client needs, that's not a good way to spend money. So if we can identify agencies that are not um, reporting well or doing well, they can either be brought up to speed, that they have to meet certain requirements, or reallocate the money to the agencies that are actually doing the work. But we really need to have a list of who the providers are to identify them. Tim? Yes, there is a policy change I think that we should know about it because the last time we went through this on the transitional care um, <coughs> program, we were told that that information was not available for a reason. That we're not supposed to be, we're not supposed to know about contract level information, and we went back and forth around it quite a few times. So I understand that we shouldn't be engaged in the monitoring function that. PHS or whoever the intermediary should be doing, but I, I would like to know if there's a policy change because we just heard again, as occurred on that occasion, look it up on the PHS website and I tried to do it at that time, it was not there. So if there's a change in policy, I'd like to know. I think the grantee should, is willing to, is ready to answer this question and I see your hand up, right? Sure. Um, I'd be glad to respond. Um, HRSA has a policy that the the business of the planning council is provider blind. 
In our memorandum of understanding between the grantee and the planning council, signed by Jan and I, um, on page 16, uh, paragraph number 8, says that planning council members and staff do not use in meetings or decision making any information about individual providers, even if it's available to members as individuals. Planning council members refrain from requesting information about individual providers through the local or state public records or freedom of information law in their capacity as planning council members. The goal of the work of the planning council is to think through and address how you serve clients with the services that you fund. The goal, the work of the planning council is not to determine who speci which specific organizations we fund. You can specify types of orga organizations, and that would be um, uh, included in any request for proposal. But the procurement is the role of the grantee. And that is very clear in terms of directives from HRSA, um, and very clear in our agreement with how we work together. At the last time that we had talked about the memorandum of understanding, and I know there's been some discussion about the MOU, we had talked about revising it and opening it up and, and having a discussion about what sort of changes would we like to do. I'm very open to doing that and engaging in that process, but knowing that um, in the MOU, it requires that any changes to the MOU be approved by HRSA. So they need to be in line with HRSA policy. So um, we can make the case, but I think HRSA has been clear in the past and was clear in June when we made the case that the business of the planning council is to be provider blind and to focus on the services to people in Chesney. So that's where we stand right now. So I take that answer to mean that we will not share with council members a list of agencies that have been funded with Part A dollars. We will not share with council members the contract award amounts, nor will we share with council members the agencies that provide food, legal services. We will not share a listing of that public information that's available on the Public Health Solution website if you have a computer. You're correct. That list is not to be included in um, planning council meetings or in plan to be used for planning council business. That list is publicly available. Should anyone want to look at those awards and look at the amounts, people are more than welcome to do that. It's, it's there and it's posted on the Public Health Solutions website. But first, it's been very clear that the role of the planning council is not to look at individual agencies. And that's to protect issues like conflict of interest, and to really focus on how we serve the needs of people with HIV. So I'll just note that that is out of compliance with local and state sunshine laws and open meeting laws. So I think that this issue needs to be addressed by the council in a review of the memorandum of understanding, because I don't believe that that is the help. Well, so Jan, you have signed this agreement, and it has that statement in it, um, so, this, this is our agreement. That's where we stand right now. So there's lots of hands up, but I would do actually like to ask, and put her on the awkward spot, uh, wondering if they wanted to comment on this, or if they have no comment at this time. You're here, we're going to take advantage of the fact that you're here. Well, So, um, what I would say to that is, um, it's actually, um, you just referenced local uh, and, and city and, and state laws. Um, actually, the federal Ryan White uh, Treatment Modernization Act, uh, it's a legislative requirement. It's not a, it's not a HRSA policy, per se, but this is a legislative requirement which defines the uh, both the symbiotic relationship between a grant recipient and the planning council, as well as separation of certain duties between planning and priority setting, and then taking those priorities and the service directives and creating a system of care, which is clearly the responsibility of the grant recipient. Um, 
So um, in our interpretation of the legislative language, we have tried to really reinforce that clarity and that the Planning Council should not be involved in discussions which involve individual providers, per se. That's a responsibility of the grant recipient uh, to assure you that they are doing the best possible job to make sure the funds that are provided provide the highest quality care, whatever the service category, whatever the provider. Um, and then to make decisions, they can certainly report back to you and say, hey, we have one or two or a whole service category which is not going as intended. We need to have a discussion about that. This is what we think we should do. Do you have any further clarification for us in terms of service directives? And I would also say, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a public health person. Um, so I will say this with a little bit of trepidation, but. Um, since we do have an Office of General Counsel, uh, I, I think I've, I've heard them say more than once that federal law trumps uh, local or state or city laws. Trump is the word. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> so we have vetted this question with our legal department at the health department. And it was their opinion that there is no reason why this information cannot be released to council. All right, there's a few hands up, but there's a long agenda we have for a think You are next, Paul. Just, um, now I sat on another federal planning body, the uh, prevention side for the CDC, and I believe they're the same government, so I was just, because they, they shared the contract information. <clears throat> so to me, um, and it's also it's called Freedom of Information Act. We can fund anything, and I can look it up with federal dollars as to uh, where it's going, who it's paying, any, because there are public dollars, whether it's individual or not. Um, I, and when we're looking at this, though, I can go ahead and tour two programs and not have the opportunity or at least to the information on touring the other. So we're giving those two programs the, um, the opportunity to show, but what about the other programs? And that, that's really the basis of this. I don't have complete information then if I'm given information on this. Lisa, were you next? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to also um, not really put her so on the spot, but just to piggyback on something they said about a very organized and working consumer committee. We're cutting edge. We're kind of like one of a kind in the country. And then the, the reason why, even at our quality of um, improvement, the QI conference, we were speaking in terms of the consumer about services provided, agencies and allocations, and all of those different levels of things. So I get what's being said about the legalistics and the this and the that and the other things. So can we get the link? the direct link to the site, because I have gone on the site, I'm on the email list, and I cannot find it. So if we can have the direct link, then we as individuals can individually look up the information without it being a planning council um, issue, since it is public information. So can we get the link? It's being said that you should not have that information, because it will influence the way that you vote on priority setting and resource allocation. I don't think there's any evidence that would support that assertion. But I will encourage you to go to the link. We will send you the link to the Public Health Solution website. It's very convoluted and, and not quite intuitive. Um, and that's why you, a number of council members sitting at this table today, asked me to print out the information and put it in your meeting packet today. And it was removed. So I think, Maria, you had your hand up, and then Steve. And then we may move on to the next subject. Um, I kind of have a problem with it because we do manage to get information from other states and everything on how to allocate these monies. And if I'm a consumer trying to provide a better quality of life for services and everything for our population, I don't see why we're you know, restricted to not seeing that information. It's not like we're going to do something really, really big. It's just to help make a decision 
And as far as allocating the money, we can see where it's definitely needed. And if we're getting all this information from other states and other places to help us make this decision, why are we deprived of our information for us? Thank you. So, <clears throat> being involved in the climate conference for the last 15 years, um, in, individually, we talk about freedom of information. Individually, everybody can have access, and you could get that information. But to discuss an organization, or if our organization gets that money at this council, it's not appropriate. Because that would be a conflict of interest. But you can have access to that information. The, what, what I would like to know, and which I think is within the purview of the planning council, is to know, in the food and nutrition category, how much money is going towards direct service versus administration? So I think you just wrapped up your question. <laughs> I'm going to move on to the next section of the agenda, which will be the next committee. I'd like to get through them all before uh, 5 o'clock. Uh, so needs assessment. Hi, everyone. Um, at the NISA assessment committee, we spent some time uh, last year um, talking about housing issues um, in New York City and the, uh, the impact that housing has on HIV uh, treatment and, and clinical outcomes. Uh, this year, we have been spending time um, looking at, at transgender populations, and something that we something that was on our agenda for a while. So, so that's what we are doing um, uh, this, this spring and the early part of the summer. <coughs> um, what we uh, did last month was um, a presentation that looked at the data, and what we wanted to do was see the, uh, the disparities in terms of clinical outcomes. And a uh, very interesting presentation uh, that highlighted the, the needs of young um, young women of color, young transgender women of color, um, and specifically uh, for African American uh, transgender women. So what we had, so we had the data. Um, we also had a presentation from Colin Lord, um, looking at the standards of care, um, how to improve service delivery um, for specific populations. In this case, in transgender individuals. What we want to do in the next several months is to invite consumers uh, to talk about their experiences, access and services, the, the gaps, uh, the emerging needs. Um, we also know that um, uh, immigration issues are, are key and central uh, of the needs. Um, so, what we want to do in the next several months is to look at a um, the, the disparities among transgender women of color uh, from different angles, from different perspectives. We want to make sure that we have qualitative and quantitative data. We have to make sure that we have the voices from providers and consumers. And what we want to provide at the end is, is a set of recommendations that uh, specifically um, connect those recommendations to our, our service categories, our, our funding streams, uh, and that we, those, so the, the, the assessment that we are doing have, has a, a, a teeth, um, has some, some, some teeth. Um, so that's what we are trying to do for the next several months. Uh, Kelly, you want to add? Yeah, just real quickly. Um, this is driven by the fact that transgender women, in particular transgender women of color, have persistently poor resolve uh, outcomes when looked at on the treatment cascade. And so um, New York State has put a lot of energy into this issue as being a statewide transgender, gender nonconforming, and in the epidemic uh, working group. They came up with eight recommendations as to how to address the needs of transgender people in regards to HIV. And so we're going to be looking also to see how we can integrate those eight recommendations into um, Ryan White Part A service work. The other piece I would like to add is that um, when you look at the numbers um, of, of 
uh, in the city, um, the number of individuals who are uh, transgender women of color is, is a small number compared to the city, uh, which in many ways give us hope that there is something very concrete that we can do um, for a very specific population um, if we really uh, have some laser focus on, on, on the service needs. Um, so uh, that's, that's all right. So, yeah. and, and also I would like to add that we must not limit the thought that it, you know, to uh, the woman of color, but there is the second tier connection, which is through sex work. Those, whether it be uh, cisgender um, um, males who are having interaction with transgender women through sex work. And then there's the third tier, which is men, those, not necessarily those men, but men who are married and are having sexual relations with transgender women. So there is, it, 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 it goes beyond just that group. It, it sort of extends beyond by specifically their sex work. So I want to remind you that this is a conversation it has tentacles and tentacles to go beyond just the settings that you can build. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the community before we move on? Okay. Rules and membership. What we started doing, um, a lot as the discussion was just um, held, we're, um, we're, we're reviewing and we're to revise the county council, the grantee memorandum of agreement, um, of understanding. And so that's one of the things that we're going to be doing um, in our rules and membership committee. We also um, thankful to Jose for his um, work and recruitment of members for the planning council. That's always a big um, topic for us and a big um, recruitment for us. We ask everyone around this table to do some type of recruitment and to recruit people of color and also PWAs to be a part of this meeting. And so the recruitment process for 2018 will be starting again. So we ask everyone to think about that and to ask friends, family members, patients, anyone who can be a part and share their voice because their voice is very needed here. And then also um, we have been reviewing and looking at um, everyone attendance. I know that some people have gotten calls or letters and asked to really review their commitment to the planning council. That uh, um, when you are here, your, your commitment is um, needed, you need to be present and uh, because there's a lot of work that needs to get done. So that's something that we're, we'll continue to do. We've, we've been doing that. And then also, um, we're developing a training guide for the 2018 Planning Council, um, especially for when new members come in to, to know exactly what we're doing in the Planning Council and really looking at the different work groups to see how, we, how each work group, each committee can, can commit to the, can contribute to the general meeting. Our next meeting will be in April, and uh, David will send out a cal yes, John. Oh. <laughs> and the uh, next meeting will be in April, and David will send out an updated calendar for when that meeting will take place and where it will be. Thank you. And I like to say, as a member of Rules of Membership, when I can actually get to the meeting. We love seeing you at all these meetings. We love seeing you at all the committees. And so we get very sad when you don't come and we start checking. And in rare cases, there have been some people who have other, had other priorities in life and you know, making commitments has just not been possible for them. You know, then I've had to make the direct phone call saying, we love you, please go. So I encourage you all to really Watch your attendance. If you miss three in a row, it's three unexcused in a row. Then unfortunately, that's when I have to start making phone calls. And we love you all, so we want you all to be here. Thank you. <laughs> and if you can, you know, you can just let us know. We can refill your seat. Thanks. Um, 
Yeah, I can't, I can't see who's raising their hand. Right, I can't see who it is. Asia. Asia. Um, in regards to the topic, I, I have to tell you that I was sweating all night long um, because I live on Kenton Island, and I had a really struggle to get here today. Is there a number, like like an emergency or whatever, <laughs> let's, let's say something happens in the middle of the night, and like that now just shuts down, really shuts down. Um, like who we could a, a contact person like in emergencies like that because I really like I, I took a cab in today and I mean I know I have to pay that yeah I, and I had to you know I mean I'm not but I just want to be able to in, in emergency situation who do you go to like I was bothering poor Billy at night and I thought I'd be David and Jan I'll pay, you know. Ghostbusters. <laughs> um, all of our phone numbers are listed on the County Council calendar, but um, um, and those are our office numbers, so we may not be at our desk. So I'll share with you our, our cell phone numbers, and you can reach us in, that, in, in those situations. Thank you. I've never overstepped boundaries. It's just, it, I've, all night long, I was like, you know, I don't want, you know, this means a lot to me. No, it's a, it's a good question, and, and we don't really have a policy when a storm happens and a meeting is scheduled at the same time as to, you know, when we make a call. Usually if the city closes the schools, yeah. we're, we're not going to be holding a meeting. But oftentimes you don't know that until the very last minute, and it's hard to notify 48 people yeah. of that happening. So that, that's sort of generally the rule that we follow, but um, we'll set a process in place where you can reach us um, by cell phone. Thank you. What if human transit in the subway shut down like mm -hmm. yesterday when the gentleman was killed? If you're on your way and, and you can't make it because of extenuating like the subway system just shutting down? Well, like we say, it's three unexcused absences. <laughs> so we don't have a list of what's excused or unexcused, but I think you can call us in those circumstances and we can make accommodation. And it's also three in a row. So one delay because of a subway accident. Hopefully it won't happen three times in a row. Thank you, Matthew. And and um, it's not it's not punitive. I mean people know exactly who they are and when they're calling out. It's not because I'm not feeling well or the subway shut down. It's because like I really don't feel like coming today and I can call in or I have work to do at my desk or, you know, something else. Most cases, there's a pattern. They show up for two, they're gone for one, and they miss three, they're here for one. It's, it's not the people in this room. It's people who tend to show up a little blip on the radar and then it's gone for a while. Uh, man, yes? You, you might want to me an excuse absences, so there must be excuse absences. So, That's correct. So we should kind of like enlighten them on what's considered an excuse of absence. <laughs> it's not defined in our bios or anything, but any valid excuse, illness, subway, crash, uh, you know, uh, you know, Hurricane Sandy, yeah, Hurricane Sandy, a uh, uh, doctor's appointment, I mean, you know, we're pretty flexible. The key is to contact us and let us know. Can we move on with this? Yes. All right. Next committee is priority setting and resource allocation. Um, Matt could, could join us today, but I'm sure that he's here in spirit. Um, so, um, uh, he's, he's, um, he's uh, at the end of a long teaching set. Um, there was a long discussion at our PSRA meeting on uh, Part A allocation um, to ADAP. And uh, the first part of the discussion included historic information and was followed by a presentation on ADAP allocation of part, uh, contributed by Part A um, by Director Christine Rivera, who is the director of the HUCP, HIV Understood Care Program. Um, and she presented generally on the ADAP program, including enrollment, funding sources, expenditures, and all kinds of great details. Um, very excitingly and um, interestingly, Christina announced at the meeting that New York State is increasing its supplemental funding to HUCP, um, which means um, that they will have sufficient funds uh, to do without the 
uh, contribution from Part A. Um, so for many years we have been making a, a large contribution to ADAP, and um, this this will this has changed, and it may change back again if there's a shift due to Ryan White author authorization or some other unexpected outcome. But for the foreseeable future. Uh, we as an EMA can safely reduce our allocation without adverse impact on the ADAP program, which is uh, great news for us. Um, and um, it's, of course, we all know that it's advantageous to keep some allocation because ADAP is a safety net for absorbing underspending. And of course, we don't want our underspending to um, increase from more than 5% of our award because if it does, um, we can lose our supplemental award altogether, which is something that none of us want to see happen. Um, and the allocation is very important because it helps us to absorb, it helps to absorb the carryover funds, <coughs> and um, which must also be spent by the end of the fiscal year or be lost. Um, as a as another administrative issue, we also use the ADAP to balance the awards between the NAI funds and the base funds. Um, so that was what we learned at the February meeting, and then we jumped right in in March, and we discussed, discussed the step process for reducing the ADAP allocation uh, to absorb reductions to the grant award and to consider service category enhancements. And we really focused service category enhancement discussions only on those that have been previously discussed and incorporated into the FY 2018 application spending plan. And that's really important. These were not decisions that were made uh, without substantial. All of these decisions have been previously discussed and discussed at length and voted on by the council for inclusion in the spending plan. Um, the committee approved an FY28 spending methodology for when the EMA receives its full award, which will hopefully be soon. And the spending plan uses the ADAP allocation to absorb an expected reduction to the grant award as a result in the reduction of the formula award. Um, the spending plan uses the ADAP allocation to absorb an expected, uh, also reallocate some ADAP money to address long-standing needs that have been prioritized again, they've been prioritized previously in our application spending plan. The first of this is to um, add $300,000 to the Tri-County Housing Allocation as per the application spending plan. This is something that has been discussed um, several times uh, here. And also number two, to increase the Food and Nutrition Allocation by $2.6 million, which will allow the grantee to increase rates so that providers can improve food quality, which is something that we have heard about um, and we want to address and will allow current providers to increase capacity, and in other words, add clients by 10%, which is, we've also gotten feedback that there are waiting lists and there, there, that uh, programs need to increase capacity. Um, the spending plan and all the details will be presented to the executive committee and to the full, discuss, full council for discussion and a vote in April. Question? Thank you, John. I, I would like to note that this is a historical moment uh, with regard to our ADAP partnership. Since 1991, we have been sending Part A dollars to Albany to supplement the Part B program, the ADAP program. The, it, it's been a healthy partnership. It's helped us to respond to understanding and to account for dollars and move dollars in an efficient way and uh, pay for much needed medications for people with HIV. We know that the Part B program, 80% of the funds for Part B program comes to New York City to help pay for medications. Um, but over the years, in the last two or three years, we've begun to question this allocation. We're one of the few cities in the country that uses their Part A dollars to supplement Part B funding. Um, and as I said, it's been a convenient relationship. But now, as we continue to see reductions in our awards, and as we continue to seek new initiatives and to fund categories that, that need additional dollars, we have to look within our own pool of dollars for where, where we can uh, help to accomplish that. 
and our Part A allocation has been ranged anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of our award. Uh, that, that's 14 to, to 18 million dollars of funding that we now need to make it open up and make it available to house people living in the Tri-County region, to pay for food services to residents of the South Bronx, to provide legal services to people on Staten Island. Um, and this discussion has been long in coming. Um, we tried to motivate this for two or three years. It was only uh, at this last meeting that the chairs of that committee were able to accomplish that conversation. So I want to commend you on the forward thinking of how we face a reduced funding in our overall award and yet support our partners at the state level with regard to the provision of medication for people with AIDS, but also help support our whole full range of services with the limited amount of money that we have. Um, so. so this is just for the record, and so I appreciate the work we're doing at the Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to make clear that for those who consumers who were present, it all came as a surprise. In the sense that though the agenda, as I looked at it, said we were looking at the um, spending scenario, and then we received the presentation for it. And none of those points were they saying that we were going to vote in the scenario itself for that particular meeting. So we were running on the subject for those who, and again, there are many of us who are new to the PSRA and the function of the PSRA. So some of the things come to a surprise because we don't perhaps clearly understand when someone writes, we are going to look at the 2018 spending scenario that it means voting on it. Not Digesting it. So this is perhaps what I, you know, that I would like for the future, whenever we are going to vote on something, to please stay that ahead of time on the agenda, because what occurred during the meeting was those consumers, several consumers, were very surprised that suddenly, from our presentation, we did some ways we are voting on it, and we were requesting for some time to happen for for the discussion, uh, and but there was a pressure to say we got to vote now, because that e the executive committee is coming next, in next month. And it actually wasn't. So it is that kind of procedure I wish to be corrected. Not that I don't agree with the spending. I think it's wonderful to work on the spending. It's just the way it proceeded, especially for consumers who are new to it, and they're shocked to see things happen in a blink of an eye without them, even when they object to it, to be involved. Duly noted, it's also a rule we're trying to have for the school council. I'm Nancy Paul. So, yeah, it is an exercise that we should try and bring here to both at this level but on the committee level where possible. Paul. So, one thing that um, it could have been said that I didn't hear uh, this is out to service providers as a result of more funding going out to current contracts and moving forward is that it's going to reduce the admin rate. Um, so pretty soon as council members, we're going to be having programs coming to us saying you've reduced my administrative rate. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, so we need to be prepared because we're going to have some people knocking on our doors who are not going to be happy that they, their admin <coughs> rate has been reduced. Although we are putting more money out to provide programs and services to the people that desperately need it. Anything else for PSRA before we go on to the next committee? Tri-County. Okay. Um, in preparation for the reboot of the Tri-County portfolio in FYI 2019, the Tri-County Steering Committee has been working on a revised set of applications. After months of data review and discussion at the March meeting, the Tri-County Steering Committee approved a spending plan for FYI 2019. The portfolio in 2018 will remain stable with an additional $300,000 to the housing service services allocation as described in the PSRA Committee's report. The FYI 2019 
plan reallocations, funds for the medical case management category, and uses for those funds to increase the food and nutrition category by 170, 165,000 to fund the new emergency financial service category at 250,000. That's where we finally came to vote on. The decision was made after a careful review of data on duplication of case management services and payer of last resort issues in the Tri-County region, as well as unmet need in FNS and EFA. The increased allocations for FNS based on waiting lists in existence to FNS programs and the average cost per client per year. The EFA, the committee used an estimated at the amount that would be needed for personnel and administration. The number of clients estimated to be served, including those on waiting lists, or unable to be enrolled in one state-funded program in the region, and the PC-approved cap of 2,000 household per year, and the fact that many clients will not need the entire amount. Once the new programs are in place on our performance base, it will be easy to adjust funding amounts based on actual utilization in future years. The full spending plan and its details will be brought to the April Executive Committee and full planning council discussion and a vote. Thank you. No. Do you have a question, Steve? Yeah. So, if you're going to do this policy presentation, but on page two, the governor on some he would include in this 1890 budget to expand HASA across the state. So this could also be a good thing for what we have been discussing for a long time with people outside of New York City. When we did this the last meeting, this I wasn't aware that this was going to happen. I know it's a victory for us up in Tri County because we've been fighting so many years for this and hopefully everything is set to go. Well, we have three hundred thousand dollars for housing. We asked for that three hundred thousand dollars two years ago. Three years ago, mm -hmm. and because of budget cuts, we were not able to deliver. But as of March first, you have that three hundred thousand dollars, and the families and the people are sleeping in bank vestibules in Rockland County, or in sleeping bags and station wagons, or in their neighbors' garages will now have the opportunity to be housed. Yes, Lisa. I um, just really kind of wanted to emphasize, because I know that there are a lot of people that really don't grasp what the Tri-County, Putnam County um, issues are. In, in, in the city, you're in uh, metropolitan, so in some counties, you're driving down the road and passing houses, and the next thing you're driving past silos and horses and cows. So when we're talking about um, Westchester County, we just changed county executives, and I know firsthand that he was not a supporter, did not want any services for housing that had anything to do with HIV AIDS um, issues. He was very, very clear that he did not want those kind of programs, and when the money was able to come to our county, he denied it. So we have a real good opportunity now moving forward with our new, inclusive, embracing county executive that we are looking forward to and anticipating um, some great changes. And I know that I have been told that it's lovely if you reach out to the county executive, but I feel like it's relationship if you reach out to the county because they don't know who the Tri-County Steering Committee is and I'm only interested in relationship. I'm not interested in trying to get somebody to lobby. So we're very excited and thank you. Thank you. So I'm noticing the time. We're a little behind in the agenda, but I really do want to give Adrian time to go over his policy presentation. Yeah.
have two, two items um, that have been brought before the council, and I want to speak to them briefly. Uh, the first item is to um, respond to the Parkland shootings in Florida. We just discussed this last month. This is a follow-up to that and the framing of looking at gun violence as a public health crisis. Um, we have a, a brief podcast I think that I wanted to share with you from uh, David Hemingway at the uh, Harvard uh, Kennedy School, School of Public Health, um, about how do you look at gun violence from a public health perspective? David, can you play that, please? Talk about, like, more broadly about gun violence from a public health perspective. I mean, could you put into perspective for people, I mean, as you just kind of touched on, I mean, these shootings do get a lot of media attention, but how do they fit into the general kind of context of gun violence as a public health problem? This is just a small, one small part of the problem. I mean, every day in the United States, about 100 people are killed with guns. This includes suicide, homicide, uh, unintentional shootings. Uh, probably over 300 or more people are shot. Uh, and so this terrible, terrible tragedy is, uh, is uh, on the same day uh, where um, we have Las Vegas where 50 people are shot and hundreds are wounded. There's probably more than that in the rest of the country, just right on a regular basis. And you wrote in this Boston Globe op-ed, and you've talked about it extensively before, but this kind of view of addressing gun violence, addressing mass shootings from a public health perspective. What, what does that mean when we talk about addressing it from a public health perspective? I think a big thing that means is that instead of focusing solely on the perpetrators, uh, you want to figure out, let's step back and figure out how we can prevent these things from occurring uh, again and again and again. What kinds of things can we as a society do? And it's, not, and it's not just law enforcement, and it's not just gun owners, and it's not just um, any group. It's like the whole society. So we're talking about what can foundations do? What can the clergy do? What can the media do? What can... Um, gun laws do, uh, and so forth. And uh, there's so many things we can do because the public health approach is a harm reduction approach, and we know that there's going to be lots of guns uh, for a long time in the United States. And so the question is, uh, right now we're dying with these guns. How can we, more of us, live uh, with these guns? And so I know one of the one of the examples that you point out of maybe a success story is Australia, which had this massive gun buyback program after a mass shooting of their own. So for people who are unfamiliar, can you explain what the Australian government did and then down the line what effect it had? About 20 years ago, there was this terrible mass shooting um, in Tasmania, the Port, Port Arthur. Uh, and it, what was really important is that a conservative prime minister stepped up and said, enough is enough and we're gonna change this. And so what they did is they bought back a mandatory buyback something like 750,000 uh, of their more, more lethal weapons. Uh, and then they st 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 tightened uh, their gun laws in a whole variety of ways. And over the last uh, 20 years, so the 20 years before this, there had been 13 uh, mass shootings in, in Australia. And since then, there have been zero mass shootings. Uh, so it's, you know, couldn't ask for more of a success. Uh, the other thing that happened is that both gun homicide and gun suicide have gone way, way down. They've been uh, reduced by, I think, more than well over 50% uh, in the last 20 years. Um, so it's been, it, 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 by any measure, it looks like an incredibly successful intervention. Given kind of the current... Uh, so the, I, I brought this to your attention last month about uh, a sense of helplessness. Uh, when these uh, situations and occurrences happen. And it also reminded you that this room is a room full of activists. We, have, as AIDS activists, created a change. We gathered together, we pressured our governments to fund programs to take care of people living with HIV. And we saw success. The same can be applied to this situation with regard to gun violence. Fortunately, younger people of this country are gathering together in 823 locations on Saturday to lobby for changes in gun policy. We should support them, not officially as a planning council, but just as human beings. If you have the opportunity to march for our lives here in New York City on Saturday, 
I would encourage you to go to that, Google that uh, March for Our Lives and you'll find out about where uh, the march in New York City will be happening on Saturday. The next issue is uh, one that we have been struggling with for um, over two years. And um, it has really become um, a challenge uh, for the city and a challenge uh, for us as a community uh, to overcome, and that's the opioid crisis. And we don't think about it specifically with regard to HIV, but it is having a very adverse impact on uh, people living with HIV and the uptick in uh, injecting drug use, uh, HIV-related infections. Um, uh, well, Play briefly a newscast, and, and then I'll have a closing comment. David? And the city's health department is tackling the opioid epidemic head on here in New York City. They're launching a new campaign, which they hope will help addicts recover and get healthy. Here's Dr. Martin, where Eric Stelzer, who draws on the announcement, is going to right here in the Bronx. The Bronx is facing an opioid crisis. Here in the Bronx, we see the largest number of opioid deaths in New York City. If the South Bronx were a state, it would be second only to West Virginia. That's New York City Health Commissioner Mary Bassett. We announced Wednesday at Monica Medical Center a more than $4 billion initiative to raise awareness about the opioid epidemic and to reduce the stigma of treatment. She says more than 43,000 New Yorkers were treated for opioid addiction last year, but says more need to seek help. Bassett says using drugs to combat addiction can save lives. These medications, which include methadone and buprenorphine, as Dr. Church has mentioned, reduce the <coughs> symptoms of withdrawal, they reduce opioid craving, they reduce the risk of overdose, and they give people their lives back. The city also announced a new public awareness campaign featuring New Yorkers for to share their stories of addiction and how medication helps them combat addiction. First Lady of New York, Shirley McRae, applauding the new program. Every day, people in our communities are dying because we do not treat opioid addiction like the chronic disease that it is. That has to change, and it has to change fast. According to city officials, a New Yorker dies from a drug overdose every seven hours. Opioids are found to be responsible for 82% of those deaths. Eric Spencer, News Public Bronx. So the data is that 1,068 New York City residents died from drug overdoses in 2017. One person every seven hours. 43,000 people sought treatment for opioid addictions. As you've seen here, the city launched an initiative in November of 2017 to address this. And they also commissioned a study by the city council. Our city council speaker, Corey Johnson, has stepped up and asked the mayor to release the study. The study supports safe consumption sites, a topic that we've discussed here uh, for two years. We have a set of contracts, harm reduction programs. I urge the council to look at that service category and to see how best we can use uh, those uh, agencies and those uh, that service model to help to speak to the opioid addiction amongst our populations of people. I also urge the council to ask the Department of Health to monitor HIV-related injecting drug use infections to see if there is an uptick in uh, our population as a result of injecting drug use uh, with relation to the opioid epidemic. We know that this is happening across the country. There are over 30 counties that are on a watch now, specifically in regards to um, injecting drug use HIV infections. And I call on the health department to monitor this closely as we collect that data. You're up, Adrian. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Adrian Guzman from the Health Department, and I just had three updates. Uh, the, the first actually Jen covered. Uh, as, as Jen mentioned, back in September 2016, the Health Department received $100,000 from the City Council to, to develop this feasibility study. And advocates, many of whom are in this room or represent organi organizations um, who participate in this, have been calling on the mayor to release the report. And as Jen mentioned, the City Council 
Um, it, I, it was actually more strongly worded than just asked. They implored, I believe was the word, the mayor to release the report. The mayor responded earlier this week, and it will be out, including his response to it, in April. And I was mentioning to Jen, I hope it happens towards the beginning of the month so that we can circulate it and get the planning council uh, to weigh in on it. If not, we certainly will come back in May and talk a little bit about how the planning council's efforts can fit into, into the plan. But one more item. Every seven hours, dying. <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 dark. It's it's crazy. Um, related to that, my next update is on Governor Cuomo's statewide efforts. If you remember, last Friday he announced a statewide expansion of HASA, as well as the nation's first ever hepatitis C elimination strategy. Uh, he announced that if you look at the quoted text, that Localities may budget and pay for up to 100% of fair market wet with support of funds obtained through health care savings. Now, I want to sort of circle the word may in there on the third line. That's an important distinction to make. And, and Local pointed it out. There's been a couple of bad historians. Just note that the governor did not mandate that localities expand the enhanced rental allowance to 30% rent cap. Local social service districts can still to decide to support or deny that, that enhancement. So it's not exactly New York City's hustle for all expansion across the state, but it's certainly a step in the right direction, and we will continue to update you on this. Um, the governor also released a DTD progress report. I included the links on the bottom. It focuses on some data collected across the state regarding linkage to care, engagement in care, and virus suppression for New Yorkers with HIV, to mark our halfway point in the DTD strategy. Uh, also, on the next slide, I uh, reiterated that the governor announced that New York will become the first state to develop a hepatitis comprehensive elimination strategy, including plans to increase access to hepatitis C medications that can cure and expand programs to connect New Yorkers and high-risk communities with HCV prevention screening and treatment services. So we'll certainly keep you posted on that. I think that directly relates to the planning council's work, and I know there's a lot of interest, as well as should be, on developing an ETE blueprint-ish strategy to address hepatitis. Um, the next one I won't talk too much about, I think it's just an interesting article that uh, the American Journal of Managed Care mentioned a couple days ago that we just passed the one-year mark <coughs> since the office, the, the, the federal office of National AIDS Policy has remained directorless. Uh, the director of ONAP advises the president on domestic and international matters related to HIV and serves as a sort of face of HIV policy across the country. So it's an interesting read. Take a look at that if you can. Um, the next update I won't spend time on, I just wanted to mention that yesterday the HHS secretary announced we have a new CDC director after four months following Dr. Fitzgerald's resignation. Uh, the new appointee actually has an HIV AIDS background, especially in, in research and Prior to his appointment, he served as the as a, as a professor at the University of Maryland and co-founder of the Institute for Human Virology, which provided treatment to more than 6,000 patients in Baltimore, D.C., and more than 1 million in Africa and the Caribbean. Uh, perhaps next time, when there's more time, I can get a little bit into some of his background and some of the uh, concerns at, uh, that some stakeholders have regarding the appointment. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is didn't quite make it onto the slides because every time I put any kind of federal budget and appropriations content, it's outdated on my subway right here. But I will say that late last night, the, uh, uh, all of our congressional leaders released the fiscal year 18 omnibus spending bill. It rejects some cuts to HIV funding streams that the president and the House and Senate at various points in the process had proposed. So that's good news. The bill proposes to flat fund. It's good news, relatively speaking. Uh, there aren't any cuts, but the bill proposes to flat fund CDC HIV prevention, all of the Ryan White parts under HRSA, and um, actually proposes a slight increase in, in hospital funding. I won't get into it until it passes. The House passed it today, earlier this afternoon. The Senate has until 11.59 PM tomorrow to pass it. If not, we would enter our third federal government shutdown in as many months. It looks like it will pass, and once it does, and there's a you know clearer idea of what the, the funding streams are, I'll put that in my uh, presentation for next month. And I 
thank you, Jen, for bringing up gun control as a public health, or gun violence as a public health issue. To supplement what he provided, I wanted to include a couple resources that the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, as well as the New York City Health Department, have released in the last couple of years. I think it's a really important issue that we, that we turn to as advocates, as Jen said, and I will continue to collect information on what the Health Department is doing and get your feedback on what you think the Health Department is doing, and I can take it back to leadership. Okay, we're Thank you. all sure on time, but go ahead, Jeff. If anybody's interested in attending the March for Our Lives event here in New York, it's taking place on Saturday, starting at 11 o'clock at 72nd Street, Central Park West. <laughs> so, Graham, I'm sure your presentation was going to be riveting and thrilling, and we're all looking forward to it. But I think we'd like to do the presentation from you equals you, and then uh, we'll see how much time is left. <laughs> Does not transmit HIV. 
sexually. And um, as you may know, uh, Dr. Manasseh was basically made a pariah in some ways here in the United States, um, and even in, in parts of Europe, um, this message was not really accepted. But this was basically U equals U 10 years ago. Okay, um, and so since then, we've had larger studies. We've had the partner study, which um, was an observational study, so it followed um, serodiscordant uh, couples, couples that were heterosexual, as well as couples with MSM, and followed them longitudinally over time and found no linked transmissions. And actually, can you click to the next? And then there's also opposites attract, which was solely MSM couples. And then the next slide shows the number of, of sex acts. So we have lots of data. I think some people were concerned the partner study, there's partner two going on um, that focuses on MSM couples. But even if we look at data from the partner study, the original partner study, study opposites attract, for male couples, uh, we have 39,000 sex acts, and for heterosexual, 86,000 times. So we have lots of sex acts with no linked transmissions at all when the HIV positive partner is virally suppressed. Okay, then we have HPT at 052 study, which was a clinical trial as a treatment as prevention, where some folks were randomized to early HIV treatment, others later uh, delayed treatment, and those who were linked early um, had a decreased risk of transmitting HIV um, to their partners. Um, and the only people found to acquire HIV in these partnerships were those who had partnership, HIV negative individuals had partnerships outside of um, the so the original partnership was a positive partner. Okay, <coughs> next slide. Okay, then what happened? Um, so that's Bruce Richmond. Some of you may have heard him speak earlier today at um, the SHAG um, this morning. And so he basically says, he says, in 2003, when I was diagnosed, I was terrified of infecting someone I loved and was terrified of taking a pill that reminded me every day that I was infectious. But in 2012, when I finally started therapy, my doctor told me that if I suppressed my viral load, I would become non-infectious. My initial elation um, at being told this turned to outrage because every website I found was saying I was still a risk. The breakthrough science was not breaking through to communities that needed to know it. Doctors would tell people on a one-to-one -one basis while withholding the information from those they deemed irresponsible. And so, he developed this U equals U consensus statement with a number of uh, stakeholders. Next slide. So this is the, um, the statement, which I think maybe Dimitri probably read when he came to uh, speak with you. And it reads, people living with HIV on antiretroviral treatment with an undetectable viral load in their blood have a negligible risk of sexual transmission of HIV. Depending on the drugs employed, it may take as long as six months for the viral load to become undetectable. Continued and reliable HIV suppression requires selection of appropriate agents and excellent adherence to treatment. HIV viral suppression should be monitored to ensure both personal and public health benefits. So just to emphasize, so New York City was um, the first uh, jurisdiction to join this consensus statement. Um, and then New York State became um, the first state uh, to do so. And so since then, I think over 600 organizations and I think 75 uh, countries have signed on to uh, the U equals U statement. And these are some of the, the organizations. Okay, so this is the, um, the CDC um, Dear Colleague letter that came out about a year after the initial consensus statement um, in September 2017. And it basically says that people who take antiretroviral therapy daily as prescribed and achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load have effectively no risk of sexually transmitting the virus to an HIV negative partner. Moving on, next slide. So in terms of what are the opportunities that we think um, U equal U presents, so we think it's a very powerful motivator for people who are living with HIV in terms of entering care, engaging in care, achieving viral suppression, and enhances the focus on healthy sexuality. And then also we think it's likely to be a huge uh, stigma reducing intervention in terms of for the general public, um, for people who may be partners, for people who are living with HIV, and I think most importantly for people living with HIV. In terms of reduced stigma, um, this may help with greater willingness to be tested for HIV, greater retention in care, um, greater disclosure, 
more support uh, for people who are living with HIV and partners becoming more involved and aware of medical care and overall um, improved quality of life. And this is a, a quote that I found online that I really like by um, Jimmy Brown. He said, undetectable is so much more than untransmittable. It is freedom. It is peace of mind. It provides long-term health benefits. People living with HIV are more than just their lab results, and our value isn't dictated by our viral load. Achieving an undetectable viral load is important, but not just because it protects our sexual partners. Okay, so this is going to be another video that really speaks to the point that was made in the I am Ashton Molot from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My name is Charles Sanchez. I'm coming at you from New York City. I live in Western Salem, North Carolina, by the Belt of the South, where HIV, um, if we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. Well, we know that that is quite incorrect. Hola, mi nombre es Ariana Lee. Soy una mujer transgénero. I am 65 years old, soon to be 66, and I have been living with HIV for 15 years and have had an undetectable viral load for the past 14 years. My name is Lyons Ignatius, and I've been undetectable for the last two years. Yo soy una persona positiva que vive con el VIH y que tiene niveles indetectables. I started treatment, and within 30 days, my viral load became undetectable. I've been living with AIDS since 2008, undetectable since uh, within about three months of my hospitalization. I'm here today to share with you what it means for me to live with an undetectable viral load. Being undetectable or virally suppressed for me means that I can wake up every day knowing that everything is going to be just fine. A lot of the language around HIV transmission rates is murky and is designed to make people more afraid. A lot of people are using antiquated information to talk about HIV. I was scared to have sex. Felt dirty inside. I've always had partners who do not have HIV, so one of my biggest fears and worries as somebody living with HIV is that I could possibly pass on HIV to my partner. The partner study has been following over a thousand couples in which one person is HIV positive but undetectable and the other person is HIV negative. In 58,000 sex acts without condoms, not a single case of transmission has been documented. There hasn't been a single case to date as a former registered nurse and as a person living with this virus, that undetectable means uninfectious. If there is no virus cir circulating in your blood, then you can't pass it on. Having this science is, is critical. Uh, there's still so much stigma and so much misinformation out there. The research is excellent here, showing that this is a highly effective HIV prevention measure. We went straight to the world's experts to get their opinions. The heads of the major studies, including Partner, as well as the New York City Department of Health, have issued statements supporting the idea that in the case of an undetectable viral load, the risk of transmission is negligible. The CDC puts negligible on the same level as spitting and biting and throwing bodily fluids. Quote, it's so low it's not worth considering. Insignificant. With successful antiretroviral treatment, that individual is no longer infectious. All this time that I've been undetectable, most of my HIV life, no one has gotten sick from me. And that's really powerful, that, that you can't get HIV from someone who's undetectable. And I think everybody needs to know that we need to shout this from the rooftops. Que ser indetectable es ser una persona saludable y no transmitible. Ser indetectable significa la mejor arma de prevención. It also means that you may have to educate your physician. As we saw at the dawn of the HIV epidemic, it can take years for the Center of Disease Control to adapt to the most relevant and newest information. My wife's doctor, she said tell me negative, how those two, as a good HIV practitioner, was getting very different information than what I was getting from my practitioner. I had to bring the research to my wife's doctor and show her that this is, you know, this this was no longer an issue. Go to the doctor and look, we want to try to have a child, what do we need to do? And she said, we have the green light to go for it. We were both undetectable, we are both active in our treatment. But if you're not actively trying to conceive, you can't have condom sex. And so now we have this confusing information. My practitioner was also kind of like, well, I don't want to share this with everybody because, you know, you sort of fit in this category of, you know, you're very type positive, you're, you're in good health, you're, you're, you're compliant in your treatment, um, you, because you're a pastor, you are, are, are not um, promiscuous. 
this year because I fit in all those categories. I'm safe to know this information politically that I was not going to affect her. I didn't stop using condoms. He didn't want to share that with everybody. Muchas de las personas no saben su estatus o muchas de las personas no tienen un tratamiento correcto. El educar a esas personas y hacer que esas personas sean indetectables a tiempo, eso yo lo llamo salud pública. We are getting married. We are enjoying intimate, loving relationships. This has given my HIV negative girlfriend and I a realistic chance to conceive children naturally. I gave birth to an HIV negative son. I do not transmit the virus as long as I'm on my medication. And I'm not stupid enough to get off of my medication. We know being undetectable doesn't prevent other STIs and pregnancy. Do I use condoms? Yeah, I actually do use condoms. We're not talking about just, you know, go out and be crazy, you know, but at the same time, I think people need to be responsible with information. Someone who's undetectable is not a threat. You are not a danger to anyone. I am not a danger to my sexual partner. I can live. You can live. That has become my new normal. That's how we're going to stop this thing called HIV. Thank you. Um, this is just a bit off, but um, 
HIV had been um, transmitted through um, breast milk. Where there have been studies. So, um, do you know studies where they've looked at uh, women and their infants and um, this undetectable and transmission to the child through breastfeeding? Right. So, as far as I know, so the data that we have is for sexual uh, transmission. It's not for breastfeeding. Um, I think they're it's probably not unlikely that the mother being virally suppressed really reduces the risk of detectable transmitting to um, the neonate, but we don't have all of that evidence. That applies to needle sharing as well. Right. Okay. So, do you equal you in science if you're undetectable, you cannot transmit. But there's some caveats around the whole transmission. Um, I had this conversation with my 10-year-old nephew. And he asked me, I said, well, if you HIV, if you're undetectable, you cannot transmit HIV. And then he asked me, how much blood do you have in your body? And I said, an average adult has about between 1.2 and 1.5 gallon of blood, which would, 1.5 would be about 5,678 milliliter. So when you multiply that by 200, it is 1 million 130, but if you're undetectable, less than 20. You're only 113,000 virus in your body, in your blood. And so he did this calculation and he said, well, it is lower if you are less than 20 and higher if you're over, you're about 200. So then the, the thing is, because HIV is transmitted through blood, semen, body fluid, the virus also lives in the tissue, correct? I'm not, I'm not a clinician. So the conversation with you equal you also has to do with your risk behavior. Um, what about getting syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, um, the kind of sex you have, in, the kinky sex with bruising, tearing, and a lot of body fluids. So it elevates the concept alone of you equal you as a scientific, if you're undetected. So there's this, all these other things that are conversation that we still need to have for all people. Yeah, and so as I was showing the number of sex acts that we have data on, so like tens of thousands. Some of people had sexually transmitted infections. Some people were having partnerships outside of their main partnership, and so we did not see any linked <laughs> transmission. So as long as people are taking their medication as prescribed, and they've had a virally suppressed Low, but let's say even if it's a month ago or six months ago, they're taking their medication every day. There's no reason that that individual should be able to, to transmit HIV virus through sexual intercourse. I think when we deal with HIV, we have to be a little bit practical. Uh, HIV. I don't in your glands, you know, where they call the reservoir. And people don't have sex with your cats. <coughs> it's what I'm trying to say. You know what I mean? You're not going to have sex there. So it's where you're having sex, which is amazing, would be the entry point. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? And, 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 and so while there are some, there are still a lot of questions. You know, I really see this science as being completely clear. L last week I was at my CAD meeting at, the, at Bronx Lebanon, and there was one of our CAD members that was going, well, he's basically challenging the you versus you. And I simply just asked him to explain what is his challenge, and that was the same discussion that you guys were having around that six months window. I remember when I first went on a trip lab, they took my, my labs two weeks after, and I was undetected. Two weeks after, and that was my first time taking medication. So, you know what I mean? A different person's body works differently. Just like the different tests give you different results, whether it's under 20 copies or over, you know, under 200 copies. So, you know what I mean? I, I basically think that the science is solid. And it is good, as you rightfully say in your slide, that, and I said it to, to, to the group at Bronx Lebanon, 
I think this would be a game changer in terms of ending stigma. I see the biggest, the biggest advantage around this is reducing stigma. You understand? Do, do, do everybody remember the days when HIV come out and people were saying that if you hug somebody, you get HIV. If you use the same cough, you get HIV, and so on and so on. You see what I'm trying to say? But this is another path, you know, a long path of trying to get to some level of assembly back to get back our lives back. You know, so I, I thank you for your presentation and I. So, we, sh we did not forget Graham, and so I would like to return to Graham. He deserves his 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> right, so the, uh, the full grade report is in your packets, um, but the highlights are here in these slides, thanks to Ashley Azor, who put these together for me. Thank you so much, Ashley. So, we received our second partial award, um, hopefully as you have as you heard from uh, Adrian, uh, the House has approved the appropriations going to the Senate by 11.59 tomorrow night. Um, we hope to have a budget which will give us our eventual full award, probably in June or July. Um, but we believe we have uh, enough funding right now for nearly six, six months of services, but not quite six months of services. So the specifics of the award are here. Um, the second partial award represented equal to 37% uh, of the 2017 formula award, 24% of the MAI award. That gives us a total of 68.5% of the formula award and 44.6% of the MAI award. So we're still waiting on any supplemental funding. Um, the Ryan White Services Report is in progress. It's due on uh, Monday, March 26th. We have 16 reports in working status, two reports in review status, 71 in submitted status. Um, so far, 33,641 clients are reported. Um, all agencies have met person benchmarks for less than 10% unknown or missing for six demographic indicators. Um, so really wonderful job. This represents all of the work of the Brian White portfolio. Um, incredibly important data because this is used when making arguments for continued funding for Congress and us having the largest award in the nation, it's incredibly important that we submit um, timely and accurate data. So we should pat ourselves on the back and be very proud of this accomplishment. Tri-County concept paper has been released. It was released on March 3rd. We convened a town hall on March 12th, which was open to all existing and prospective providers to comment on the concept paper. Um, do, any comments are due by April 20th. When we, release, when we release the concept paper, it's our signal to the community that we will be um, releasing a full RFP, usually about six weeks later. So we expect to issue that in April, May 2018. New contracts resulting from the RFP will uh, begin on March 1st, 2019. Um, for the first time, we're going to do an all providers meeting. In the past, we have um, separated out providers meeting by service category. Uh, this will give us a chance to convene all the Ryan White Party program funded providers. Um, and it, um, as I said, it differs from previous years. More details to come in terms of what the agenda is going to look like but it'll uh, give uh, people in service categories an opportunity to engage in peer learning. News from the Bureau of HIV, we're very excited to launch our Living Sure campaign. It's a new sexual health marketing campaign that encourages women, including cisgender and transgender women, to consider pre-exposure prophylaxis as part of their sexual health. Developed by the Health Department's Women Advisory Board, um, and uh, just want to, uh, you know, when we first put out information about PrEP, it was really focused on MSM and transgender women, and this is uh, sort of filling in the gaps in terms of our public messaging about PrEP, and we're very proud of this. So this campaign will be on newspapers, subway cars, subway stations, um, and it's part of the end of the epidemic uh, investment that the city has made. 
Also exciting news from the Bureau of HIV, actually from the uh, Bureau of STD, is the reopening of the Chelsea Sexual Health Clinic. After four years of being closed due to renovations, we have a new walk-in facility that offers PrEP and PEP, immediate <coughs> ART, counseling services, contraception services, and the HPV vaccination. So really focusing on beyond just a typical um, STD clinic, really focusing on sexual health. We're very proud to have, have it open again, and we appreciate the community's patience as it was closed. But also recognizing that the closing of the Chelsea Clinic was actually one of the important galvanizing forces for the community um, in terms of helping the health department to understand how do we better engage with the community and how do we better respond to the community. So though it's been a, a challenge for um, people in the Chelsea area, I think it really energized um, the department in terms of us being able to respond uh, to be more supportive of the sexual health. So very proud of that. Also, um, Project Succeed, which is our uh, SPINS grant from Puerto that is a jurisdictional approach to addressing the needs of HIV and hepatitis C co-infected persons um, is funding healthcare practices in New York City to receive training and technical assistance to help people with um, people living with HIV and hepatitis C move, move towards a cure for their hepatitis C. Also, um, I wanted to report back that we have a um, program that's funded by Ending the Epidemic that sort of uh, combines Brian White Part A harm reduction pro uh, program funding with ending the epidemic funding to serve persons HIV negative and HIV positive methamphetamine users. Obviously, the Ryan Watt Part A serves the HIV positive persons. Um, we presented this to the um, disease control, and we reviewed the program's efforts to address the needs of MSM and transgender women who use crystal meth um, with program utilization data and client demographics. We focused on the program outreach efforts and the impact on clients. Um, we uh, highlighted uh, the program's outreach in non-traditional sites, including bathhouses, sex parties, and kiki balls, um, and really addressed the strong need for individuals to be connected to services, including housing applications, pet prep, and psychiatric care. Um, we we're working on an evaluation program for the plan for the program. Um, and we are very proud of this collaboration and proud of this program in addressing the needs of um, this population. Thank you, Aaron. So we are slowly losing people here. I see Randall Bruce just signed up to provide public comment. And you had your hand up, Melanie. So I guess you hand up earlier, so I'll let you go first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this question is for Oni. I didn't get to ask this at the end of your presentation. We see the push that the department has put financially behind PrEP, and obviously it still continues to put behind PrEP, but we know that treatment as prevention is actually the more cost-effective um, intervention. So I'm just wondering, in terms of funding and, and pushing this message out, what are the plans of the department, and will it exceed the kind of marketing that the PrEP campaign has gotten?
game. And one of the things that a lot of people are complaining about it is exactly what Steve just did in this conference. He made everybody seem afraid of being undetectable and having sex. And all the um, other things that you do in having sex, the provider uh, that give you, that you can, you can get the virus from. The young lady made a presentation saying that they did myriad sex um, studies and nothing happened. Yet, Mr. Hemorrhage turned around and said, but there is a caveat. There should be no caveat. That is putting fear where fear is not needed and that's putting stigma where stigma is not needed. That's my point of view. Okay. Graham, my next thing is to you. We do not need to know your procurement procedures. We just need to know who has been funded, which is what you have done in the past. When you did the RFP for um, well, um, testing, you gave us all the agencies that received the contracts. You did not give us and how much money, you actually told us how much money they got, got. It was in the back of the program. Yeah. We do not need to know your procurement procedures. We just need to know who you are giving the contracts to and what money they are getting. We don't know, we don't need to know what you do to, get, to, to give them the contracts. We just need to know who they are and what money they're getting. That's all. There's no big thing about it. If we can go into the public record and look for it, and I had gone into public solutions thing to find out, their listing of what it is is so hard to find anything, particularly that information. Anybody going into it in there would go, what are they talking This is easy to find. You can't find it. That's the whole thing. So I don't see why it is so, excuse me, Persa, you told me this on Tuesday when we were talking, that that's not our purview. But our purview is to know who you gave the contracts to and how much money they're getting. We don't need to know what you did to give it to them, how they got it, anything like that. So what's the problem? So much for public comment. Go ahead, Graham. Thank you, Randall. I appreciate your, your comments. Um, so, also in the memorandum, memorandum of understanding is a clause that says anytime we conclude an RFP, is that we are to report the results of that RFP to the planning council, hence the, the list of testing contracts that we reported to you. Um, I uh, have received information from HRSA, and there's an MOU that is signed by us as an agreement in terms of how we work. Until that is changed, that this is how we we'll conduct our business. If there's a change in the MOU and the legal counsel agrees with it, and HRSA agrees with it, and we agree with you, then that's when we would change that practice. But until that changes, this is our binding agreement in terms of how we work together. So I. I'm sorry, but that's that, that's how we work together. Oh my God, we're never going to get out of this meeting with these hands up. <laughs> sorry, I know you had your hand up, Steve, for public comment. And there's two other public comments, and then I'm closing the floor. So, I, I would like to address part of what Melanie asked earlier. And I think the Department of Health needs to get kudos for what they're doing. When somebody tests positive, in their sexual health clinic, they're offered jumpstart immediately. And for a lot of the young people, and we talked about doing a few I on this, a lot of young people who are coming from the Department of Health, the ones that are less than 30, have all taken jumpstart. And the reason, and I when I ask them why they offer to take jumpstart, their major concern is they don't want to look like they have AIDS on Instagram, Snapchat, or Facebook. 
And so I think we are going to, for the new diagnosis, we are going to see a higher viral load suppression than people who have been, because every single one of those clients have accepted Jumpstart. And I'm talking about 146 clients. So I know somebody's hijacked a microphone. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm here to, to, to deal with that aspect that Randall just mentioned. And I'm going to keep and, 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 and I'm going to do it very quickly too. I, I, I have a problem with, and I'm glad Ursa is here, and I want Ursa to listen to what I'm saying. I find that a lot of the time when we hear the grantee speak, I don't think the grantee is speaking on a basis of fact. I think the grantee take unto themselves certain powers that they don't have. You understand? Like, like, for example, giving information to the planning council members to make a proper, proper decision. Like, for example, I give an example. We are now updating food and nutrition directive. Hi, me as a planning council member, ask for the amount of contracts that are in the Bronx, the amount of contracts that are in Brooklyn, the amount of contracts that are in Manhattan. And to some instances, I'm being told that I can't get that information because it's a purview of the grantee. How can we make a proper assessment of the need in the Bronx if we don't even know how much people providing service in the Bronx? I, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm not a bright, but I think at kindergarten level we learn that. I don't think this is university level. That's just plain simple. We make policies. That's what we do. And if I'm wrong, maybe somebody can correct me. The planning council, the various body, whether it's IOC, whether it's needs assessment, that's what we do. We make policies. We invite the people in, ask them what is the problem, what did they need, and with that, we upgrade and update the directive. Grant, Mr. I don't want to say grant, but I want to say the grantee. You have to see many just trying to wrap it up. The grantee job is to take that policy and implement it. For example, we might need two providers in the Bronx. It is a grantee purview to find the providers, not the planning council, the grantee. It's their purview to find the people, give out the contracts, and then supervise the contracts. But our job is to make a policy. And, and I think that is the, the, the problem what we're having versus grantee versus planning council. Because the, there's this, there's not this line that clearly shows what the grantee must do and what the planning council uh, process must do. And, and, I, and, and I just want, I'm glad that Ursa is here for them to hear how concerned we are as as consumers about this riff or this issue and we want some sort of a finalization to this issue. You understand? Thank you very much. Thank you. Saw you the last one. Can you make it short? No, I think we all want to Alright. Can we go please? Thank you. Can we make a motion? Yeah. Can we make a motion to adjourn please? Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention, and we'll see you next month.